easier actually. So the lane is really, really short. Um, and your distance between your lane and the other lanes is really short as well. Now, because the lane is short, it is hard to kill your opponent because you can't chase him very far because he's got a turret like right there, right? Right. I am unless you like phenomenally outplay your opponent. Right. If you get a great Gragas ultimate, that dude's on your side of the map. Go for it. Right. Body slam the guy. He's gonna die. No problem. If you're an Oriana, you get a great shockwave. All right. Go for it. Right. If you're a Zed and you are level 11 with a Blade of the Rune King and Brutalizer, all right. Maybe you can one shot your opponent. But if you're like I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a, like a low kill matchup, right? Like, even Ari can't force kill, like, Ari versus Orianna. Like, even if you did outfight that champion, she can shield and get back to her turret. You're not going to actually kill her, you're wasting ultimates to do some damage. Um, so, if you're in the mid lane and you're going to balance ganking versus farming, if you're going to balance map pressure versus farming, which is, I think is actually the more accurate description of this question, um, you wave clear. And this is why all the popular mid laners are your Ari, Oriana, Zed, these guys who kill minion waves really, really expediently. In the case of Fizz, it sucks at the beginning. And then you hit level 9, you get a couple of Doran's rings, and then you use Playful Trickster. And then you kill the backline, and you just auto attack the front ones once each, and then you can go and make some plays again. Um, and so you clear the wave as fast as possible, and then go somewhere. Even if all you do is clear the wave and walk halfway to Dragon and back, if you're not getting ganked on that because you should have some ward coverage, you have them sping MIA, you have them ping MIA, I don't know what sping is. Um, the bottom lane, if you go to the bottom lane, has to be like, you're right, I'm s hold on, hold on, we can't play aggressively, Fizz is missing, right? And they immediately give up turret pressure if they were the ones playing aggressively. Or, they don't react and you're like, F, alright, sure, I'm gonna go kill bottom lane then, right? Um, and it's it's free, it's freer than Willy. Um, and, and that's, the, that's the, the pattern you get yourself into, right? Clear a wave, show up. Clear a wave, show up. Clear a wave, show up. In the mid lane, you don't typically kill the turret um, because mid laners are usually very bursty. And although they can't kill you if you're in the middle of the lane, if you're at their turret, they can. Right? These are champions with wave clear. These are champions who kill your minions off, CC you under the turret, and then jungler shows up. Because the other side effect of being in the mid lane is not only do you get away really quickly, people come to you really quickly. And so, right, I'm Fizz and I'm hitting your turret with my little pole arm, and Sin Zhao shows up, I'm dead. Because I've got to go all the way across my lane, I'm not going to get back to my turret in time without dying. Um, so you actually rarely see mid laners siege turrets down. Um, now, you can see it sometimes if you have ward coverage. If the mid laner got pushed out of lane, you know you're going to 1v1 the jungler and win that fight. Then you'll see guys hit the turret. And it's usually actually guys like Oriana or, or Ari who are ranged and then can, you know, charm or dissonance or something to get away to be safe. Um, but you you don't see a l you don't see a lot of Gragas' auto-attacking turrets. You you can see it, they can use their ult to get away, but less of it. Um, so mid lane, right? Push the waves down, try to show up. Um, if there's really nothing there, if there's really nothing there, then Then you can like take wolves, you can take raids, things like if you're a Ziggs and you just don't have anything to do, then you can just go farm jungle camps for a while and okay, you can at least do something. But you still shove then go and do something, you shove and do something. The less time you spend in lane, the better for a mid laner. Um, just to close it out, let's talk about what top laners do. Um, top laners uh, balance ganking versus farming. Top laners are actually the one role that actually pushes a lot. Um, right, if a top laner can bully his opponent out of lane and kill the turret, um, then, then great. Now this is, this is hard because you have to get some really good ward coverage, and I'm not a great top laner, so this, some of this advice might be wrong at a high level. Um, so take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but this will generally work. Um, if you're winning your top lane, right, and you start to get to the point where you can shove the, shove the wave down and then get to his turret, you can break the turret down slowly but surely, right? If you get that, what if you're winning in top lane? Right? Remember that most top laners are tanky guys who are pretty beefy, and of course you have a jungle laner team who's also probably pretty beefy you can start forcing turret dives in 2v1s, right? Get a little bit of ward coverage, and then pu pull that Lee Sin in, initiate with Counter-Strike, and just kill the enemy champion. You can do this as a top laner. You can 2v1 under the turret as a top laner from level 6 on. Um, you get that little bit of pressure from your jungler, and you break the turret down. Immediately. That turret is, is yours to kill. It's very, very easy to get rid of. You know, compared to a duo lane, um, it's actually pretty easy for a duo lane to kill turret as well, to be fair. Uh, but as soon as you get that jungle gank in there, you kill the champion, you kill the turret, now your world is open as a top laner for, for balancing ganking versus farming. You actually sit there and put pressure on your own lane. Because in the top lane, 
You are so far removed from most of the objectives on the map. You are far away from Dragon, you are far away um, from the mid turret, you're far away from everything else. If you start pulling pressure to yourself away from the other objectives, your team can make plays. And this is why one of the big contingents of a top laner is being durable and getting away with fights, right? If I'm Shen or Zack or Jax or Riven and I get ganked, I have a decent chance of getting away in the 1v2. There's a decent chance I just get out of there. Um, and that's by being a good top laner, right? A, a good top lane champion as well as a good top lane player. Right? Even though Mordekaiser could win a bunch of duels, Mordekaiser doesn't get away from a 1v2. Unless you're stupidly ahead that you kill them 1v2, you're not in good shape. Even Rumble can, like, equalizer and throw harpoons down and, and like, put the scrap shield. He's got a way of getting out. And so you're, you're going to put pressure on the map. Now when Dragon's dead, when the outer turrets are all gone, okay, now you're going to do a little bit less there, and you actually require a lot of ward coverage to get things done. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, but as a top laner, in the general scenario, where you get your turret down, you're winning your lane, you push really hard, and you go up to that second turret. Now with your gold lead, you should be investing in wards. You should be spotting when the mid lane roams to you, you should be spotting when the jungle roams to you. But whenever they do leave their lane, your team should be able to make plays off of that. You are pulling attention to yourself, and that's why top lane is usually called an island. Because when you put attention over there, you give away dragon, you give away mid lane pressure, you give away bottom lane pressure. Um, that is kind of how the top lane, I'm starting to get ahead, what do I do thing works. Now, some top laners will also run teleport, right? They have less kill potential in lane, but they say, well, I'm going to shove all the time, then I'm going to show up somewhere else and help a fight out. Um, great, and because you've been pushing, their counter push is going to take some time. Maybe you lose your turret, maybe you don't. It's all the stuff that exists, right? So there, there's basically ganking versus farming um, in, in all of those roles, and, and it's a pretty decent summary on how they each work, so... There's a question answered for you guys. Um, I'm actually going to put up. Um, I'm actually going to put up a disclaimer that I am just doing Q and A at this point. All right. Um, next question. Let me see if you guys. That was like, by the way, a 20 minute answer, but whatever. Um, someone asked how is Jinx? Jinx is uh, really, really fun and to my knowledge quite strong. Um, Freak, don't you think that the curse that, that in the current Assassin Heavy meta, Sona is pretty weak. Her ult is dodgeable. When you have a lot of gap closers, you can easily assassinate without burning too much. Um, I disagree. I think Sona is actually one of the ideal supports for uh, Assassins. Um, because Sona can force kills. Um, so if, if Zed jumps someone, right, and I'm Zyra, I can maybe root him in place. I can put down Stranglethorns, but generally speaking, Zed got to do what he wanted to do. If I'm on the ball as Sona, and I see him deathmark, I can crescendo over the top of where he's going to land, and he has no way of dodging it. I can, I can overlap where he's going to land with deathmark and be like, you're here, bam. Because they're all very predictable. If Fizz goes in, if he uses any, if he uses Playful Trickster ever, you know where he's going to be. You can catch him with Crescendo. Your team could focus him down. You have basically dedicated lockdown, one and a half seconds of, of dedicated. You are in this place now for your team to focus that guy. Now, sure, Fizz casting these guys are probably going to buy Azonius at some point. That makes your life more difficult. Um, but it is pretty easy to Crescendo people as Sona, and also. Most assassins take more than two seconds to kill. Uh, if they do focus on a, if they use their ultimate as well, it takes more than two seconds, right? Deathmark takes a while. Cassidy won't one shot you. Fizz needs the shark and a couple of auto attacks. Like they've got to either burn their ultimate or take a long time to kill you, which means that you have plenty of time as Sona um, to put your ult down in, in a good spot and, and and whatever, right? Get the W heal on whatever, like. If they burn their ultimate to kill you, and you burn your CCing their team, you've both blown your cooldowns, and okay, you're dead, but here's a Zed without an ultimate, who's burned all his cool, all the rest of his cooldowns, dealing damage to you. He's not honestly doing that much either. And you still crowd control the entire enemy team. Um, and you still got the other five members, your other four members of your team with full cooldowns able to do much. Um, now, comparatively, right, if you look at what Zyra was doing um, against champions like Ari, is, right, again, Zyra doesn't really stop 
people, stop individuals, I should say, that well. Zyra is very good at at dealing with a bunch of bruisers, right? Zyra crowd controls large teams for longer um, than Sona, um, but right, Ari versus Zyra, we've seen this a lot actually, um, especially in competitive play, where the Ari just runs in and one shots the Zyra and then disengages and does this in open field. It's not like, oh, it's a team fight and I've like got myself out of position. It's like, I spirit rush charm DFGQ'd you and then I dash back out and then I can just wait on a 40 second cooldown of spirit rush. Like That's not a big deal. Um, so, you know, uh, you kind of have that scenario there if you're if you're Ari. Um, and then, of course, you get back out and no team's going to re-engage in you 4v5 because Ari's, Ari's actually less reliant than someone like Zed. Um, now, yes, if you're Sona and you get caught, then sure, life's going to be difficult. Um, and if you have to crescendo and, and whatever, then okay, sure, right? Um, but uh, there, there are more tools for the Sona to deal with those situations because crescendo is reliable and it actually stops all damage output. Um, so I, I, I think that it's incorrect to call Sona weak here. What is the best uh, runes on an AD carry? Full attack damage or some lifesteal? The page that almost all the pros seem to be using is attack damage marks, armor seals, some combination of magic resist and mana regeneration glyphs. The Koreans like to run mana regen. And then for quintessences, it is two lifesteal quints and one attack damage quint. Um, so... That's the page, and that gives you a good mix of sustainability, a good amount of attack damage early on for trades and, and last hitting and whatnot. It tends to work out. Uh, SE Whitey asks question, Mr. Freak. Hope you could help. Um, I have a flaming problem um, during games. Any tips to help me stop it? It makes me lose a lot of matches. Um, so. As someone who actually used to flame a lot in games, um, I got I got warned in beta and stuff. Um, it's it's convincing yourself of a state of mind, basically. Um, so you can go full Zen master, and I actually have I have a friend who um, basically consciously like, and I might be overstating this because it, it I, but basically she she like consciously like forcibly is happy all the time, um, like. I don't want to be like like psychotic or anything. It's just like she she is like she tries to always be happy. Just like in any situation, it's like I'm gonna be happy. Like I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna smile. Anyone I see, I'm gonna be really cheerful to. Like she gives a lot of hugs just cause, right? And like who who declines hugs from like happy, attractive females, right? Um, I have a female friend who's just like yeah, it, she's just like is just consciously happy all the time. Um, and and she says that. Um, that actually helps her be genuinely happy as well because she has just a positive outlook on everything, right? And it's just like happy about everything. Um, and I'm I'm not that full Zen master, right? Like I I don't do that necessarily. Like I'm so happy I'm 0 and five, but um, right? But you, you find joy in everything. Um, I'm sorry, I always lose trains of thought because I'm bad at this. Um, Now, as far as not raging your teammates during the game, it's it's a mind state, right? It is a it is a state of mind you need to put yourself in because you've got to realize that raging actually doesn't help, right? You've got to realize that that yelling at people doesn't help, being passive aggressive doesn't help, asking for ganks, right? Saying, uh, you know, I really wish you would hit that hook, like sure, right? But like, like imagine, right? Imagine, imagine I'm really frustrated with this blitzcrank, right? For like, he's missed every hook, he's baited me, right? Like. You know, and you say, like, man, you know, I really wish you would hit that hook, right? And it, it, you can express your frustration, right? You'd be like, I really wish you would hit the hook, dude, right? It's just like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less calling you out. Like, I'm dissatisfied, and I'm, I'm expressing how I feel, like, I'm fully, like, upset, right? But it's like, blitz, you effing suck is very different from that, right? Like, if you really need to vent, then, then sure, right? Be like, you know, I, w you know, I, I wish you would ward top lane, man, or like, like, please, like, please ward top lane, like, please ward the jungle gangs, dude. Like, you really need some wards, right? right. Fizz roams out of the lane and ganks you, and you're like, you ping, right? like, Ari, please ward that brush, dude, right? And, and in your mind, right, in your mind, in your voice, you're like a little bit angry. You're kind of sarcastic, like, dude, just ward that brush, right? 
But if you type like, Ari, please word that brush. That doesn't sound like raging at all, right? So, so if you, if you, at the very least, at the very least, if you can keep the words neutral, that's at least partway there, right? Like, at the very least, there's baby steps here. Now, the goal, the goal is to just be fully constructive, right? The goal is to be like, dude, uh, you know, you should really ward there, right? Um, it's, it's to be, it's to be proactive about this, right? If you see a gank's coming, right, start pinging back, right? Back pings, right? Be like, oh, the dude's got no ward, right? If you look over and Trinomir's like hitting a turret, he's got no wards, and you like know there's a jungler, be like, dog, dog, there's a jungler here, right? And just ping, right? Be like, there's a, please leave. And you can be proactive, and you can, you can save yourself a lot of the, a lot of the rage, a lot of the, uh, the heartache. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really about you, like, identifying what to be mad about, right? I feel like I'm, I'm actually not addressing the topic very well because it's, it's, it actually became a very simple solution for me, which was I just stopped getting mad. I, like, I try to win, right? Actually, and here's, here's actually the more direct question, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like, pretend I'm re-answering right here. If you have a raging problem in solo queue, realize two things. Feel free to care and try to win, right? Try your hardest, right? It's, it's ranked play or, or whatever, right? Like, right? You, you only ever rage if you care because otherwise you wouldn't have an emotional reaction to losing. So obviously you care, right? So continue to care, continue to try to win, play your best, absolutely. But realize that the result of this game doesn't actually matter, right? I have gotten into and out of Diamond One promos on my freak account, like probably ten times, and I've only passed it like four. I've probably failed more promos than I've succeeded. I've gotten into Diamond One probably like four or five times now. I've fallen out and I go right back in. And even though those games matter, right? Even though it's like, man, I have to win this best of three, or I get demoted to di back to Diamond Two. I've got another month, right? And, and this is now. I've still got another month. Like back in the day, I had two three four five like there's no rush right like you don't get extra rewards for being in diamond longer you don't get extra rewards for getting plat five in august instead of in september or october there's no actual value right now to this game you are playing now yes in the spirit of competition try really hard that's what i do i love competition right i have two accounts in diamond i'm still trying to get this one higher up right i tried really hard that game it's not even as high as my other account still trying really hard because i care right and even though my team was, was making mistakes, and Nami got caught doing Baron, right? She just, like, straight up just died in the Baron pit. I was like, oh, that's too bad. I'll just have to defend now, right? So so feel free to care, but realize that it it's not the end of the world, right? It, 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 it really doesn't matter that much if you do lose. And if that calms you down just enough that you're not raging anymore, right? It's like, man, and to be fair, it is, it is frustrating to lose a game where you played well, right? You made a lot of good decisions, but man, that Riven's just 5-0. and oh, And it's like, yeah, that kind of sucks a little bit. And th there's two ways then to approach, I like how I put one figure out, there's two ways to approach that situation then, right? Man, that, Riven fu that Riven's 5-0, and oh, man, that sucks. There's two ways to approach it, right? One is, it's just not that important, dude. Like, try your best, but at the end of the day, you lose some games, Right? Like, everyone go look at your match history. Or not your match history, but, like, your stats, right? I, I have, like, a hundred and something wins and a hundred and something losses. I've lost, like, 170 games this account. All right. Yeah, at 170 losses, one more doesn't really change anything. Doesn't really, right? I mean, think about the last game that you threw. Everyone's thrown a game before. I remember throwing one where I decided to MF ult in the face of five people and then didn't flash the Malphite ultimate. I was like, well... I threw that game, we were winning. Everyone throws games sometimes, right? Just be like, well, all right, you win some, you lose some, right? And you, you just get past it because you can queue up again and play another game, right? You've got plenty of time to get rewards. You've got plenty of time to get gain elo. It's not that important at the end of the day. The other is to consider it a challenge, right? How, how many competitive pro-level games have started out with one team getting a bunch of kills early on and another team come back and winning? Cloud9 versus Vulcan or Dignitas, I forget. Had it been Vulcan. No. Would have been Dignitas. Yeah. Cloud9 versus Dignitas, game one, right? Cloud9 versus Dig, game one. 
in the, in the um in the North American Regional Semifinals. Dignitas starts out like six and one or something. Yeah, it was Dick. Um, starts out like six and one, right? Cloud9 starts out way behind. Now, how many solo queue games have started out where you're down six one in kills? Good number. Cloud9 like held it together and came back and won. And you know what? The practice they had in playing games where they were behind, both in solo queue and competitive or scrims or whatever, useful information. They knew how to play from behind, and that made them stronger players, and they won the game because they played properly from behind. Now, maybe you have aspirations of play playing at a competitive level and playing ranked teams and whatnot. I don't know. Maybe you don't. Um, but at the same time, you're still playing a mode where you are trying, right? The only reason you're raging again is because you care and you're trying. Um, so, yeah, dude. Sometimes you start out games where your team is behind. And you know what you need to learn how to do? Win when you didn't get first blood. It's a learning experience. Sometimes they've got a fed top laner, and you've got to play around the fact that the enemy top laner is bigger than you expect. You've got to learn how to kite a really big ribbon. Okay, deal with it, right? And you can think of games as... Um, you can you know you can think of games as, as learning experiences. So um, there's another thing for you guys. Um, all right, who's got one? Bro, I'm uh, nah. Don't want to answer that question actually. Um. Uh, question freak. I've never been really truly explained what kiting is. I feel as I do it to a small level and have a basic understanding of it, but I love Lucian and feels I'm not making full use of the kit. Can you maybe explain about kiting mechanics? Yes. Um, so kiting is the general the general version of the term is I'm a ranged guy or I have a range advantage over someone. And I want to keep attacking you while still maintaining a range advantage. That's basically what kiting is, is still getting to hit your opponent while still being out of reach. And now this comes in a variety of different forms. Um, so for example, let's say there is a 70 and 0 Riven. Massive, massive Riven. If all your cooldowns are down, and you're going like, to walk into auto attack range as Graves... That's not kiting. Like, even if you're hitting from your max range, you tend to walk backwards, you're not kiting because that dude's going to catch you. You have to be able to actually ensure that you are remaining out of range, or at least out of, like, the grasp of being killed. So if you're like Ezra the Trinity Force, you can kite a uh, Riven by just going for max range Qs over and over, right? If she ever commits to you by running forward and spamming Qs, she will not reach you. And when her last Q and dash has been used, then actually... Heck, you can go auto attack now because now she can't close that gap anymore, um, and so you you are always out of her potential reach. Um, if uh, in one of these games I was Caitlyn versus a, a Renekton and a Nocturne, um, as well as a Cassidy, and after trying to disengage away from the Nocturne and, and the Renekton, whatever, I would sit there at max attack range and attack whatever I could. And if someone walked towards me, I would take a step back between attacks and shoot them. And take a step back between attacks and shoot them. And take a step back between attacks and shoot. And until the Rexon got into slice and dice range, I could just do that over and over. And he sat there taking damage and taking damage and taking damage. Then I would put a trap down at my feet. And I was like, if you walk forward at this trap, I have another second and a half to do whatever I want. And I'm still kiting you. You're out of reach of me. I'm dealing as much damage as I am allowed to deal while still staying out of range. And I'm using all the tools necessary, traps, 90 caliber net, what have you, to ensure that you can't reach me. Um, now, in some cases, this actually might mean not attacking at all. In one of those team fights, I was down to 200 health, and knew they had a Cassidy. And I went back a full thousand units, and I was like, Riftwalk Q will kill me. I'm going to go way back here. Now, if you Riftwalk, and you're not in spell range, I can walk back towards you. Because I have a bloodthirster. I'm going to get like 100 health back whenever I hit you. So you burn Riftwalk. And you are still far away. I can shoot you from this far. You can cue me from that far. So I can shoot you and walk back. And walk back. And walk back. But I only have that 4 second window to do it. 
because then Ritfot comes back and he'll kill me. So I have this very small window to do something and kite my opponent and lifesteal enough that I'm no longer able to be killed. If I am full health, I no longer have to play that range against Kassadin because he can Riftwalk in EQ and I can not care. Um, and so I can kite him from my auto attack range. Not a thousand range, I can let him Riftwalk EQ me and be fine about it. In fact, he'll probably Riftwalk and I will 90 caliber net, but I will then go and resume attacking him because I don't really want to be in melee range, but still I'm not really very threatened by him. Um, so, so kiting becomes, as you can see, very complex because it, it matters, um, well, I'm actually in range of dying. Um, what is their actual range of killing? There's actually another special circumstance, right? Like, um, let's say Cassidy, right, can't kill me with an EQ combo, but he can kill me with Riftwalk EQ, right? He's got a double stacked Riftwalk right now. Now, my kiting range is different. I have to kite outside of rift walk range. In fact, I have to kite out of force pulse into walking forwards into rift walk because that will kill me as well. I've got a 90 caliber net the second he goes for a silencer or a force pulse because he will close the gap. I have to immediately get myself far enough away that he cannot kill me. Uh, you know, it gets more and more and more complex, um, but that is that is, you know, a, a good way of shedding light into what kiting is. You have to respect the kill potential. You have to respect the range of what your opponents are able to do. And you have to deal as much damage as possible while outside of kill range. And that's kiting. So good luck! It's a little bit difficult. Hey Freak, I aspire to be a League Shoutcaster. How can I make this happen? If you want to be a League Shoutcaster, start casting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to liken this to anything else. If you said, hey Freak... I want to be an artist. How do I start making art? I would say, start making art. If you want to be a shoutcaster, start shoutcasting. There's a bunch of stuff out there to shoutcast. There's a bunch of stuff out there. Whether you run a YouTube channel, whether you try to cast NESL games, whether you try to partner up with any tournament organization, right? Tons, tons of people like running tournaments, and tons of people like having a shoutcaster cast their tournaments. Now, to be fair, I'm right not casting NACL. Now they have other casters doing NACL, and they've got um, you know some very good casters doing that. Um, but like those guys are also going to be too busy to do like the the random tournament that some guy hosts on a weekend. That's just you know for twenty dollars RP for first place, right? They're probably not going to be doing like the guys who are doing that. Like um, I'm like actually blanking on the names right now, even though like I actually watched those games today. Um, but like there, there are tournaments open there that you can just get onto as an aspiring shoutcaster. Um, Malf yeah. So um, yeah, it was Studio and Malphus last time I watched. Um, yeah. Um, so if you want to be an aspiring shoutcaster, go do it. Just like begin. Go go stream. Go go to YouTube channel. Do stuff. Um, uh, let's see. Freak, I'm interested in being an analyst for a pro team as a random hopeful. Um, how do I accomplish this? Um, go partner with one of the websites that likes to publish um, commentary and analysis on you know, LCS or any of the competitive scenes, right? There's sites like Claw5, Leaguepedia. Like, go do what Spellsy does. Spellsy was just like a guy who was like a really, really good sport player and was like, I'm going to do analysis, dog. And just decided to do it. Right, and then League Pete puts up puts up his stuff a bunch. I think he's with Cloth Five as well. He just did it right. Like he partnered with someone and did a bunch of analysis. And if he if people like his analysis, and a team wants to pick up an analyst, here's a great body of work that this guy has just done that you can look at and be like, yeah, we need a guy like that. Right? If you want to aspire to do something, go do it. This is this is a great thing about community sites and, and esports and really actually anything at all you you can do anything for free to get your name out there if you want to shoutcast 
Guess what? We're on Twitch TV right now. You want to post analysis? Post them up there. You want to you wanna write articles? There's a bunch of fan sites out there. Right? Monte Cristo didn't start casting... Um, like, OGN champions out of nowhere. He was like, yo, I'm gonna... I, he started his own website. He started GG Chronicle. Got a bunch of people on staff. Put a bunch of stuff out there. Right? And then, more or less, put together an audition tape, I'm sure, for the uh, the the spot at OGN. was like, yeah, I'm gonna start doing things because I want to progress in esports. Right? And, and that's the thing, is like... like you need to be able to be active about this. Like... Opportunities do not typically fall into your lap. Some do occasionally, and some people get really lucky. But, like, you can't clutch an opportunity unless you've done something. So, for example, random things that happened in my life. Um, my Warcraft 3 team's manager's roommate in college worked for Riot and asked me to apply way back in beta. right? And I also met him um, after that at um, two different tournaments. Um... And so we became friends, we got contact, we traded contact info, right? This is Byron Akira, he's one of the writers now um, um, for the, like, news posts and stuff on LeagueOfLegends.com. Um, so I, I got lucky and was like, hey, I, seven years ago, got a contact at Riot, basically. Right? That's pretty lucky. That wouldn't have meant anything if I hadn't been doing a bunch of Warcraft 3 shoutcasts since I was 15 years old. When I was in high school, I was like, hey, shoutcasting sounds fun, and started doing it. So, like, yeah, opportunities show up, but you don't get to make anything out of opportunities unless you were working towards something in the first place, right? Like, yeah, may maybe, I don't know, maybe spells he got lucky and happened to, like, get a contact at League PD or something, and, like, you know, he was kind of fortunate to have contact info with someone. But at the same time... The dude was doing a bunch of analysis work on his own. He was putting up like support cards that you could like learn how to play the support champions really well. Like, dude was just like, "Here's the stuff that I can do." You know, got a little bit fortunate in building contacts. Everyone gets a little bit fortunate building contacts. You just it's how that works, kind of. Um, and then built something off of it, right? This is this is how stuff works. So, no matter what you want to do with esports, or what you want to do with anything, no matter what you want to do anywhere. Push towards it, and then apply that when opportunities arise. That is how you succeed in everything, right? Whether, like, literally everything, right? Like, if you, like, really want a girlfriend or something, right? Well, right, like, work on being a, a confident person who can who can talk to other people, right? And, and I mean, me being a hardcore nerd and, and like... Yeah, I, I was really bad at talking to girls for a really long time. I still think I'm very good at it, but I've gotten better at least. Um, I learned to be confident talking to girls and was like, yo, hey, I'm going to actually have a conversation with you and like have the courage to walk up and say hi and then maybe ask you out. Um, turns out it's 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 not that hard. Like, um, Shoot, uh, here, I'll pick an example. I dated a girl three years ago. Um, her name was Christine. Uh, still is, I trust. Um, and like, uh, so let's see, just to tell the, the quick story, right? Um, I was invited to a board game night by one of my rioter friends, right? He and his girlfriend are hosting a board game night, and I came along, and, and um, his girlfriend had brought along one of her friends, this girl, Christine. I uh, never met her before, whatever. Um, so I met her at a 4th of July party, and I met her at this board game night afterwards. And after meeting her basically twice, I was like, this girl's really cute and really interesting. And I was like, actually, why am I not doing anything about this, right? Like, we went home, and I was like, hey, actually, and I texted um, I texted the, the, the girlfriend, who, right, the one who was hosting this, um, this event, and was like, hey, would you mind giving me Christine's number? Like, I want to ask her out. And she's like, sure, yeah. And I was like, hey, Christine, this is David. We were just at the board game night. You want to go out? And she was like, yeah, sounds fun. Right? Like, okay, it didn't work out, right? I'm saying, like, whatever. But, like, point is, it was like, oh, hey, I, I was myself twice and decided, sure, let's try, right? And and, and this works in, with everything. This works with everything, right? Is is if you you if you build yourself, if you put the forward the effort to, like, to build yourself to be... Uh, able to 
be social, right? And again, I, I bring this up a lot because this, this is something that I had to do and like learn to be social. Um, maybe you guys don't have that problem, that's fine. But if you want to like, hey man, I really want to get into art. I really want to get into game design. I really want to get into esports. I really want to get into shoutcasting. Go basically practice that on your own, right? Go draw, go shoutcast, go make flash games like whatever it is right learn 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 to code and make games like go go mod things off of like the warcraft 3 map editor right which is how but look at ginsu right ginsu works at right and the dude like hey i'm gonna freaking update this dota map for a while right like decided he wanted a game design got a job doing it yeah okay cool he you know i think he actually got recruited but like do things and things arise, right? That, that's that's where it that's where it comes from. That that is that is the lesson I will repeatedly, repeatedly tell you guys is take charge, do things, and things happen. All right. So I hit that topic for like seven years. Let's move on. Um, actually, I need to clear chat because it's scrolling too fast. I'm sorry if you guys just ask questions. Um, but I'm gonna have you guys re up on questions here. So someone asks, hey freak, I have a game question. Does the Chinese jungle meta in the world prove that gold flow in the jungle is broken? Um, I mean, they just get buffs and they just gank, being tanky support with every champion. Um, the thing is, like, and it's unfortunate we didn't see more games from Cloud9 on the global stage, but we saw how well they performed against a an on-point fanatic. Um, and Meteor style is clearly has functioned, right? They beat all the other North American teams decisively on a on a farm-based jungler, right? Heavy gold Evelyn, heavy gold Zac, heavy gold Nasus. Okay, yeah, it's really good to bring a tanky guy because most guys who jungle tend to be tanky guys, right? Like, like we actually look at the the guys who can both jungle effectively and gank reasonably well, and yeah, like eighty percent of that roster are, are frontline tanks, right? Nas is best built tank, Zach's best built tank, Sejuani, Nautilus, these guys are best built tanks. So, so some of what you see is like, well, because that's what the roster is. It's like saying, well, you know, the squishy AD carry meta. It's like, well, no crap, squishy AD carry meta. Like, you have to build squishy to play an AD carry. Um, so it's it's a li it's a little bit misleading um, because we've we've directly seen we've we've seen in competitive successful offensive based like jungle Evelyn like go watch Diamond play right she's like one of the best junglers in the world dictates champion pools of other regions right like he was the guy who brought jungle Eve out largely. Isn't building tanky. Spirit of the Elder Lizard, Haunted Guys, Sorcerer Shoes, Deathfire Grasp. Tanky jungler meta where, right? Like, so, so, like, I, I think it's it's really weird to be like, yeah, this is the way the jungle is played because it's not really true. Um, now, sure, a lot of people do donate farm, and, and they're successful with it, and that's fine, right? Like, I'm actually glad people can play it different ways. I just think it's really weird when people discount, like, that there's only one way of playing the jungle. It's like, yeah, they all played this way. People used to also bring AD carries mid for the first season of the game. They realize that we don't want to do that anymore. We just learned to do differently, and that we realized it was more optimal. Like, that's going to keep happening throughout the game. Um... So I, I basically reject the the immediate notion that like you can only play low farm, um, tanky junglers. Um, uh, so someone someone uh, brings up um, so about the promotion series being a best of three. Why not make it an actual best of three with like you had like the same teams right? Like you have to play the same ten guys and you play a best of three for promotion. Um, that's actually very, very difficult for a couple of reasons. So number one, it, it actually adds a lot of constraints onto what kind of team you can get. Because you need to actually get 10 guys who are all in series at the same time. Uh, it takes, that takes a lot more time than just, well, let's match people who are close to my, ma to my matchmaking rating, right? Second is, 
how do you play the second game? So you queued up. What if a guy's got? What if a guy only wanted to play one game? Right? Like, what if a guy can't commit to three hours of play? Like, that's that's you know, kind of the entire point of League of Legends that you can play for like forty-five minutes. I mean, okay, like a lot enough time that you can play a long game in case it's there. Like, don't screw people over in case you play a longer than average game. But like, we're not requiring you to spend three hours on a sitting. Right? And so there's actually a lot of issues with, with trying to have a system where you like play the same guys. You either like what you wait a week for the guy to show back up, like it's really rough. Oh, it's because I I my foot's actually on my um the back of my desk and I keep kicking my uh my desk. Um one second. Alright, it's gonna be my last one. I should go to bed after this. It's already two in the morning. Um Freak, is it ever worth leaving the fountain with a lot of gold, let's say 1,000, to save up for a BF sword or need this large rod? Like, spending the gold on other stuff delays big items by too much. It really depends. It really, really depends. I've actually gotten in the habit really recently of buying a lot of small pieces of things. Um, so I have I have done a like a, like a build where, like, I know I'm going in, like, let think of a good example. If I know I'm going in Infinity, I just pick up a pickaxe. It doesn't matter. I've been in games where I know I'm going Bloodthirster first. And I will buy a pickaxe. Because I really want to have that 25 AD for the lane. Because it, it allows me to do a whole lot of things. And I know I'm going to get a last whisper eventually. Or an infinity edge. Like that pickaxe is going to be used. What I'm basically doing is, is investing in the short and the long term. Like when you buy an item you're going to use later. You invest in the short term because you have an item and it's really good. And you invest in the long term because you're going to have it again when you complete the rest of the item, right? It, it pays itself off then. Now, in the middle term, where you're like, oh, I can't afford Bloodthirster just yet. That is a little awkward, sure. And there's no direct, obvious answer. There's not, right? Like, if I know I really, really want to rush a Chalice, or, like, I really want to get a Fiend's Unholy Grail, and I have Chalice done, and Fiendish Codex done, and I have 850 gold when I go back to base... I'm not going to wait 50 gold for that Chalice upgrade. I'm also not going to buy a Blasting Wand. I'm going to be like, well, that sucks, but as soon as a recall, I have Athenes. Um, so ultimately, I think it, it really depends. Even though I'm going to use that Blasting Wand for a Death Cap or a Void Staff or something, it, just, it really depends on, on how important that breakpoint is. Because in the case of like, a Bloodthirster, right? Like, if I have, if I have, let's say a BF Sword and a Vamp Scepter, and I'm just waiting on the Combine, I'm not going to buy anything. I'm not going to like get another Long Sword, I'm not going to get... Like, maybe I'll go Boots 1, but like, I'm going to I'm gonna save for that Combine. Whereas something like a BF Sword, it's just stats anyway, right? Like, yeah, somewhere down the line you'll get a Bloodthirst, but you can't guarantee on any of those breakpoints anymore. You either come to the end of 25 attack damage, or you don't. And I, I feel like it's a very easy choice there. Um, where if you're not close to a Combine, I would say buy components of other things. All right, real last one now. Um, uh, Freak, what are your advice on runes? Um, should I keep the same ones typically, or do you advise that I match my runes against the specific champions that I'm matched against? Generally speaking, um, you can get away with one rune page per lane, and a lot of these actually double up. Um, so, for example, let's say. Let's say you're gonna you're you're an AD carry player, right? And you think you can reliably get the roll. You can build basically two lanes. Or you can you can get basically two pages, and they're not even that different. But one would be a bunch of flat magic resist on glyphs, and one would be magic resist per level um, on the glyphs. If you're pay, playing like a Janna Ezreal lane that has really really low magic damage, um, whereas if you're fighting like a Sona or a Zyra or a Lulu, you really want that flat MR. 
Um, or if you're like 2v1ing, of course, you're not going to take much match damage early on. Um, but that's not even that big of a difference, and you don't really need to care that much about it. Um, as, far as, as far as building against specific ADs, there's not much you're going to do differently, because you're going to use flat armor seals, you're going to run the same marks and quints no matter what. The only small difference would be that I've seen some guys run a uh, page with armor glyphs to deal with like an ergot lane, but you're not going to see those very much in, in your standard play, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, as for the rest of your lanes, um, you can really just play flat armor, flat MR um, in pretty much every um, every mid lane. In fact, I've seen... Uh, so Faker actually will run um, either health per level or armor seals and just ability power per level glyphs. Even ag like He was playing against an Ari as like... Uh, I want to say like Zed or something, right? Like... Uh, he was playing against Ari, a magic damage assassin who's going to try to all him, and he was like, I'm not going MR glyphs. So he either like has really big confidence in his ability to outplay, or he knows something that we don't, or something, but that guy didn't even run MR. So if you really want to be like full safe, you can run just like magic pen, armor, AP per level, AP, and that'll work for like basically every lane. Um, uh, top lane, I would just do... If you know you're going to play ADs, I'd do attack damage, flat armor, probably MR per level, actually. Um, just because, so if you're facing like like a Sona Lulu lane, you're going to take a lot of magic damage poke early on, and they're, they're maxing their harassment. But like, in a top lane scenario, you actually fight minions a lot more, like minion aggro is a bigger deal. And you don't take that much spell damage. Like, okay, Rumble might hit you a little bit, um, but there's actually not a huge difference between having... 36 and like 46 MR like it's obviously different but like it's not huge right you're gonna you're, you're gonna be in the defense specs you're gonna get some extra MR there you're gonna get some MR per level of being a melee bruiser guy and so you know you're, you're already spawning at like 36 or so right and then MR per level is gonna give you one and a half at level one so you're sitting at like 47 48 so it's between 48 or, or sorry 37 38 so again difference between 37 38 and 47 48 not as big, so getting the scaling per level, like, it kicks you up pretty well. Um, and that way you don't feel, like, bad for fighting an AD top laner, right? Um, but it's pretty easy to make generalist pages. Um, okay, yeah, if you fought a Zac or, like, an Elise, I would run flat MR glyphs if you know it's coming, but um, you don't need to, like, heavily tail. There's actually not a lot of heavy tinkering you're going to do on matchups is this like one like one rune slot you would change but generally speaking it's pretty easy to make a generalist page um all right that's gonna do it for me for real so uh good night guys thank you for watching i will stream um probably next week i have a pretty busy uh, i maybe i'll stream some sunday but uh i'm going to one of my friend's wedding uh, yeah i'm going to my friend's wedding on saturday um i'm just gonna be gonna be a little bit busy so um i'll See you on the future. Thanks for watching, guys. Let's admire me for a bit. I came to ask you a question. Would you rather be sliced and diced across section? Juggle session, check the arms flexing. Chick stick mass and I'm stacked to perfection. Deadly warrior, pro wrestler attitude. I'm about to make you famous, show some gratitude. And if you